in low return on value. So, for example, if you're spending a lot of time managing documentation, but you still find yourself encountering risks way downstream in a project that were not uncovered, well, the cost of going back and reworking that problem goes up quite significantly as the program matures. Everyone knows what that chart looks like. Uh, so the, the payoff comes in two forms. One, um, you're providing insight earlier on, so you're, you're deferring or you're alleviating any costs that might be incurred as a result of rework. In addition, the cost of compliance a lot of times what we see is with output documentation, um, the, frankly, just the speed at which you can respond to a new compliance request, whether it's a set of documentation, whether it's a, an output or a functional sim. So your ability to respond to requests more quickly allow you to um, realize a higher return. The cost of implementing, certainly there's A, a learning curve. Um, B, there's implementation just in terms of getting everyone up to speed training but what we find is that certain projects can adopt this very quickly and uh, the next project becomes much simpler to implement finally as you look at the uh, the cost incurred in the capture team the ability to more quickly respond with more meaningful insight in an early uh, pre-milestone A environment uh, can mean a tremendous amount on the capture weight, the, the win rate. So if you look at going into a down select and you're pitted, uh, a document centric organization is pitted against a model based organization in a down select competitive environment, whose proposal do you think will have more sensitivity and trade off studies and analysis of alternatives? Um, what we find is that the model in the execution of the model to give you more data early on can arm your capture team with far greater sensitivity studies and these AOA studies so that um, the, winning, the winning team can move on. So capturing a down select for a major multi-million dollar program uh, certainly increases your ROI on this kind of implementation. Another question regarding the uh, integration with other disciplines and other models, maybe physical simulation models or CAD models. Um, absolutely, so a, a, a key element here is that we can reach out through our API or any good model-based systems engineering tool should allow you to connect with uh, physical simulations. Uh, this may be something very simple like a MATLAB script that helps you estimate the range of a sensor based on certain parameters. So a parametric model would help you arm your functional model with the proper physics of the problem. So we believe that the model should connect in with other models so that you can build accurate representations and get the most up-to-date fidelity or get the best fidelity you can at that stage in a program. Um, you can certainly build in connections with higher fidelity simulations and what we've even seen where you go into um, taking let's see taking the elements of the model for example the interface and being able to connect to even more constructive sim for testing out scenarios and to be able to test out some of your your con ops so you may have a trade-off study between various con ops and various op, uh, options for implementation, uh, certainly you should be able and you can export these interface definitions so that they, you can then feed your modeling and simulation environment downstream. So interoperability with these other, other simulation tools is really critical to give you the right fidelity. Uh, there's a question regarding the um, size of the project and the rigor around the SE methodology and tools and, and, and frankly, what it, and I'm paraphrasing, but the approachability of the tool. So how can you implement what appears to be a very rigorous methodology on what may feel like a fast-moving, small, agile project? Um, if you go back, I think the key to this is understanding the simplicity of the entities, the relationships, and the linkages. 
So, you know, when we talk about how to build this model, uh, this may be a very simple representation uh, that gives you some insight in one or two aspects of, of your design. So a couple things. One, you know, a lot of the confusion and a lot of the apprehension around MBSE comes from this exact fact. It appears to be quite unapproachable. And the reason is it, it does appear to need so much rigor that there's a fear of that learning curve. And there's actually just a fear of the overhead associated. The reality is a model-based approach is far more dynamic and gives you so much more time to rework or to modify what you're doing in a way that you can't do with a static document approach. Um, so these tools are very amenable to fast-moving programs. Um, it really, the, the application at the right level and the right decomposition is really the difference. So I would say that a model-based set of tools can really facilitate a team to move and maintain quick movement. Um, it's only if you choose to get into um, the bookkeeping aspect of it, if you will, the accountability, the auditing aspect of it. Use the model to gain more insight and to do these trades earlier on, and the payoff will be, will be tremendous. You know, the learning curve to be able to build up a model and then begin doing these trade-off studies, we do um, four-day training classes, you know, a, a matter of a week, understanding and decomposing the model. So, you know, the learning curve and the getting up to speed is really measured, I would say, in weeks. And, you know, a matter of a, of a couple days, you can certainly be up and running with the tool. Um, you can be, um, you can outfit a team of engineers um, in five figures budgets. So we're not talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, it's an affordable approach. There, are, um, And it's also a learning curve that pays off because what you find is as you go through the, the training and as you climb the learning curve, in a matter of a couple of weeks, you're, you're able to understand more about your model. And what you find is your, your schedule accelerates because you're pulling uh, maybe conceptual design or conceptual elements early on in the program. So identifying the risks, it's really a matter of the scope of the program you want to take on, but it certainly can be done. It can be done in a timely way, and it, it can certainly impact the program fairly quickly. So we have a question about the model and its um, representation, in particular how to do this in a, in a physical testing environment, physical hardware testing environment. So the model is the a living document, if you will, and the model then becomes uh, your way to connect and to represent uh, even downstream in V&V &V activities. Uh, we certainly recommend and we certainly follow a uh, rigorous versioning and management program, you know, configuration management, if you will, a configuration versioning of the model as we go through iterations and versions and life cycle, but the model stays with you through the program. And the reason the model stays with you through the program is you want to know what, what are the relationships that were built, what are the key risks, and in particular, how do we um, design a test program, for example, around the key risks. In addition, the, the executable and functional model stays around in a testing environment because you want to verify, you want to look at, uh, can you reproduce these, these issues, these problems, do you really have a problem in the bandwidth or is your logic flawed somewhere in the hardware? So it's a good question and I would consider the model as a living document and I certainly would um, consider it something that grows with the program and only adds value uh, continuously through the whole program. So I have a question about DODAF and CORE and the benefit or how does it work. So DODAF, um, what we have done in CORE is built a series of what we call representations or diagrams or documents that are outputs of the model. So what you're seeing um, represents a snapshot of the model. So for us to go from a dynamic, fluid, moving model system to a set of static 
documents or what we call charts representations uh, we're taking snapshots in time so the DODAF representation the DODAF architecture allows us uh, or provides a view that's consistent with DOD from the model so we don't necessarily design in a quote, you know we don't quote unquote design or work in DODAF DODAF becomes an output language that then is consistently communicated to DOD. So we take snapshots of our model, convert it into documentation and representations that are DODAF um, compliant or DODAF ready, and then that can be your uh, one way to communicate with your customer or your sponsor. Okay, I think we're wrapping up with the questions. As promised, we're going to get you out of here within the hour. We certainly appreciate your, uh, your time and attendance today. Um, we certainly look forward to having you on our next webinar. We're, um, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar very shortly with uh, all of the questions. So if you missed, if your question um, didn't get answered in the Q&A session, we'll be sure to follow up via email with uh, all of the, pers all of the uh, attendees who asked questions. This webinar um, will be, the recording of this webinar will be posted online very shortly. And as we mentioned, we urge you to, to continue the conversation. To, we we want to hear from you. And we want to hear from you through the forums that are on our community site. So uh, please feel free to uh, drop us a line, drop us a note, and add your comments so that we can keep this thread going. For Vitech, I'm Brett Malone. We certainly uh, enjoyed having you on the conversation today, and we look forward to hearing again from you very soon. Thank you and have a good day.